Hi everyone, I'm Towney. I'm in ITS Teaching and Learning and today I'm going to give you a very fast crash course on several tools available to you in Sakai and I have several colleagues who will be monitoring the chat and so because we're covering a lot uh, we do ask that most of the questions be posted in the chat. Um, I will also stop periodically to see if there are any questions you prefer to ask out loud. I will also be sending you all a summary of what we discussed today along with several help docs on what is covered here and then the session is also being recorded so that will be included in the summary as well so um, if there's anything you miss you can always review that um, so then let's go ahead and begin so first i wanted to point out some ways that you can get help and you all should be seeing my screen with the sakai homepage right now and so on here, I wanted to point out the tutorials icon, and this is where you can find all of the help guides on Sakai tools. And then there's also this consultations icon. So if you want to get personal assistance with one of us from ITS Teaching and Learning, you can sign up for a personal consultation on this calendar here. You can also always go to help.unc.edu and submit a help request. You can also call them at 919-962-HELP. You can also chat with them online. If there's anything that they cannot answer, then they send it to our group. All right, so on the Sky homepage, to log in, you would click on the Onion Login button here at the top, and that will take you to the Sakai home tab. So this is your personal space when you're first logging into Sakai. And what you will see here at the top are all of the sites that you are a member of. So if you're a new faculty, if you haven't created your course site yet, you will likely not see any sites yet. But once you create your course site, it will be listed here at the top. You can also click on the sites button here in the top right corner to access other sites that you are a member of. I also want to point out here the message of the day section on the home tab. This is probably where you saw this workshop for today, but this is where we post announcements to all Sakai users. So I recommend checking this out to see what resources are available to you all and to the students. Okay, so to begin, we are going to walk through creating your course site. And then once we have a course site created, we'll look at sharing your course materials with your students, communicating with them, um, sharing other course materials in other different ways in the Sakai tools, assessing their learning by administering online testing quizzes, collecting their, um, their papers and the assignments tool. And then we'll also give a quick overview of the gradebook. So like I said, there is a lot to cover, um, but all of this is being recorded. So if you want to review this later, you are welcome to do that. Okay, so before you are able to create your course site in Sakai, there is something that has to happen on your department side. So the course scheduler in your department has to list you as the instructor of record for each of your course rosters in Connect Carolina. Once that happens, within a few hours, your course rosters will be tied to your Sakai accounts, and then you will be able to create your course sites. So if you are going through Sakai and not seeing your course rosters in this process we're about to go through, then you would know that your departmental scheduler has not listed you as the instructor in Connect Carolina yet. Also keep in mind that Sakai data will update three times a day. So if you were just listed in Connect Carolina, it will take a few hours for that to update in Sakai. Same with your students. If they just added or dropped your course, it will take a few hours for that to update in Sakai as well. Okay, so to create your course site, what you want to do is click on the sites button here at the top and then click on create new site. And I see there's a question about TAs. So if an instructor is listed as a TA in Connect Carolina, they will not have the ability to create a course site in Sakai. You have to have either primary instructor, secondary instructor, or proxy instructor roles in Connect Carolina in order to create your course site in Sakai. So oftentimes what I see is the scheduler would list the TA as one of those other instructor roles, or they might list you as the primary instructor and then the TAs as a TA on the official roster in Connect Carolina. So once you create the course site, then the TAs and your students would automatically have access to your site. Okay, so again, to create your site, you want to click on sites up here, create new site, and then that will take you 
to this page here in Worksite Setup, you want to select Course Site, should be listed under Fall 2020. Click on Continue. And then what you should see on the next page uh, should be all of your course rosters that you would have in Connect Carolina. So if you're not seeing your course rosters here, you want to contact your departmental scheduler. So since I'm not an actual instructor, I'm just going to enter some information so I can go through this process and then click on continue. And this text editor is what gets displayed on the overview of your course site, which is essentially the homepage of your site. And so for now, we can just leave this blank so we can create the site and then we'll go back and edit this information. Click continue. And then here you will see all of the tools that are available to you in Sakai. You can always go back and add remove tools as needed. So for now, we'll just leave the default tools checked. And then here in this section, it's showing you how you can copy materials from another Sakai site into your site and you can still do that after you create your site. So let's say you're teaching this course this fall and then you're going to reteach it in the spring. You can easily copy co course content into another Sakai site. So for now, we'll just leave it as is and click continue. And we're going to leave it in draft mode and that just means to not give students access yet. And then continue. And the last step for you all should say create site. So just click on that and then within a few seconds, your site should become available in the top menu. You may need to refresh your browser, but it should appear for you up here. Or again, you can click on the sites button and then locate your course site here. So now I'm going to go into one of my demo sites. And as I mentioned, it will take you to the overview page, which is basically like the home page of your site. So what you might want to do in this little site information display section is add an introduction of the course, maybe your contact information and introduction of yourself, things like that. So if you want to edit that section, you click on this little um, edit button here and then you can enter your information here. So what I, what my site was displaying was the keep teaching site and that's because I just have a redirect URL for that. And you can do that or you can just enter the information you want in this text box. Click on update options and that will save your changes. You will also see on the overview page any announcements that you post to the students and we'll talk about communication tools here in a bit. But first, I want to take a look at the site info tool. And this is where you would go when you want to make changes to the overall site. So if you want to add or remove certain tools to use in the site, this is where you go. If you want to reorder how the site is, uh, the, the, the menu here is listed, this is where you would go in site info. If you want to see who is a member of your course site, you can scroll down in site info and then see all of the students. And so your students will be coming from Connect Carolina. And so that will automatically update the course enrollment on your site. Okay, so first what I want to look at here in site info is the manage tools tab. And this is where you go to add and remove your tools. And so like I said, you can always go back to this list and check or uncheck anything that you want on your site. And so what we're going to be talking about today are the announcements tools, the assignments. We will take a quick peek at the gradebook. We will talk about something called the lessons tool. We'll look at messages, resources. We'll also look at the syllabus tool and testing quizzes. So if you're following along in one of your course sites, you're welcome to enable these tools on your site now. And then scroll all the way down and click on continue and then click on finish here at the bottom. And then another option I wanted to point out is this tool order button, and that is how you reorder the left site menu. This is also where you can hide tools from students. So if you're testing things out and you don't want students to get access to that yet, this is where you would go to hide that tool. And so you click on tool order, and then if you want to hide, let's say we wanted to hide the resources tool, you can click on the gear icon, say make tool invisible to students. And then if you hide something, this is how you can um, show it to students again. Or if you want to reorder how something's listed, you can just click hold and then drop where you want that located. And so any changes you're making, make sure to click on save. I'm just going to cancel. 
And then there is the option um, import from site. So let's say earlier we talked about um, copying content between Sakai sites. This is where you can do that after your site has been created. I also want to quickly point out this manage groups option. So this is if you want to break up your students into groups. So let's say you have student group projects or you might have online discussion forums where you want to break up your students into their individual groups. This is where you can create that. So under manage groups, you would click on create new group, enter the title, and then here it will list everyone who is a member of your site. So you just click on the student's name and click on the arrow to move them into the group member list and then click on add. Now you'll also notice anytime I click on a tool name here at the top, or in the left menu, that will reset a tool that I'm in. So if I'm clicking around a lot and I just want to start from the beginning, this is where I can click on and it'll just bring me right back to the first page of that tool. All right, any questions that haven't been addressed in the chat? And I realize we're going through this very quickly just because there are a lot to, of tools to cover. Um, so just let me know if you want me just to slow down and repeat anything we have talked about really quickly. All right. All right, so let's talk about communicating with your students. So there are two tools essentially that you might use and they're pretty similar in terms of how you would use them. And so briefly we talked about the announcements tool which appears on the overview page. So you, to send an announcement, you would click on the announcements tool from the left menu here. And in most tools, you will see this top menu here. So when you want to create a new item within that tool, this is most likely where you will be clicking on. And so you would click on the add tab, enter a title for that announcement, the body of the announcement. If you have groups created, you can also send an announcement to just a specific group. And then you can, if you want to schedule these ahead of time, for example, you know when you have your midterm scheduled and you want to send the students a reminder, you can specify when that becomes available. And then here at the bottom, you can also add an attachment. And then here at the bottom, you can update the email notification. By default, the announcements tool does not send an email notification to students, but you can change that to high to send it to all the students so that they get a copy of this announcement in their UNC inbox. And then just click on post announcement. And then it would appear here in the announcements tool and on the overview page. The other tool is messages. Students also have access to send a message. And so this is what you would use if you want to send a message to individual students. You would click on compose message. And then here in the to field, you select who your recipients are. You can still send to all participants and that just means everybody on your Sakai site. So essentially it's pretty much what the announcements tool does. You can also select just the student role. You can also scroll down to individual students. If you have groups created, you can also send a message to those groups. Same for the students. They can use the messages tool to email their classmates or to send you a message. And then as long as you leave this box checked, it does send a copy of this message to their UNC email by default. And then you would enter the subject, the message, you can add an attachment and then just click on send and that will send the message to the students. I want to point out this big yellow bar here at the top that says unpublished site. And so what that means again is that students can't access the site until we click this magic publish now button. So once that's clicked on, students will automatically get access to your Sakai site. So anything you're doing right now, if your site is still unpublished, students won't see any of that until you publish it. And it doesn't send any kind of announcement or notification to the students when you publish it. It just appears for them automatically at the top. So if you want to, you can send them a message or announcement just to let them know the site is ready for them to access. All right, so once you do publish your site, the first thing the students are probably going to look for is the syllabus and that can be posted in a number of different places. So there is a tool specifically for the syllabus if you want to post it here. So if you want to use this tool, what we have here are items within the syllabus. And so you have to cr create 
a syllabus item. Click on add item, enter a title. Just going to call it syllabus two. You can copy and paste. Let's say you have it in a Word document. You can copy and paste that content in here, or you can upload it as an attachment on the next page. And so I will go ahead and publish this item. And so then I will click on this item I just created, and now I get the attachment option. So that's all you have to do here. The other place where you might upload your syllabus is the resources tool. And this is pretty much where all of your files, all of your articles, readings, lecture, PowerPoint slides, this is where you would upload those files to share with your students. So think of this like the documents folder on your computer. And so what I've done here is I've broken this up into different subfolders, which you can do. So you might break it up by the week or you might break it up into this is where you can find all of the course readings. You might have one for your lecture slides. So however you want to organize your resources, you want to start by clicking on the actions menu here at the top and you can click on create folders and then enter the folder name. And then all you do is click on create folder now and that creates your folder. And so if you do use these subfolders as you're uploading files, just make sure to pay attention to which actions button you're clicking on. So let's say I wanted to upload something into this lessons folder. I want to make sure to click on the actions menu for that folder then click on upload files and you can open your um, explorer or your finder window um, highlight the files you want to drop in and then just drag them into this box here and then click on continue to upload the files you can also just click on this button here and then select individual files to upload and then don't forget to click on the continue button here at the bottom all Sakai sites have two gigs of space. So if you're ever curious how you're doing on space, you can always click on this little check quota button and then see how much storage you still have on your site. Any questions? Still feeling okay? Hopefully. Okay. All right. So this is the main place where you would share course content with your students. In a little bit, we're going to be talking about another tool that, uh, that allows you to share all of your course content with your students, and that's called the lessons tool. That's actually what I recommend using. So just keep that in mind and we'll take a look at that here in just a bit. But what we're going to move on to now is ways to assess student learning. So collecting their papers and then administering online tests and quizzes. And so Let's first look at the assignments tool. And so this is how you would collect any written work from your students. So as you're first creating your assignments, you would click on the add button. Once those gets, get created, those will appear here in this table. And then that's where you view your student submissions. So first, what do you want to click on is add. You would enter the title of your assignment your instructions here. You can add the honor pledge that students have to check that off before they submit to this assignment. If you have any instructions or files to share along with this assignment, you can upload that here. And then you have the different dates here to pay attention to. And the open date is basically when it becomes available for students to see in the assignments tool and when they can start submitting to it. So really this could be today if you wanted it to be. And then you would enter the due date and then the accept until date will either be the same as the due date if you don't accept late submissions or you would put the later date and all that's going to do is put a late notification next to the student submission it doesn't deduct any points so if you want to do that that would be up to you as you're grading and so you just click on that field and then you can choose when to make it available the specific time and especially if you are teaching remotely, just keep in mind that students could be all over the globe right now. So when you're posting due dates and times, I recommend um, reminding students that this is in Eastern time or whatever your time zone is. So if it's due at 11.55 p.m. Eastern time, make sure to specify that. Um, I uh, discourage the use of saying the word midnight because it can mean the night before or the night after. So just make sure to clarify with your students exactly when their assignments are due. 
And then one more date to pay attention to is here under allow resubmission. And so this is if you want to give students multiple attempts to submit to this assignment. And so you would check that box here. And this is attempts in addition to the original assignment. So let's say you want to give students up to three total attempts. You would change the resubmission to two attempts. And so what this means is that students have to submit their assignment by the due or accept until date. Once they do that, then they get this option to submit it another two times if they want to by the specific dates. And then some other options uh, right here. Under student submissions, you can choose to accept only attachments. So if you want students to upload Word files, for example, you, would, you can select attachments only. And the inline option, what that just means is students get a big text box like this where they can type their responses. And then here you have some grading options. So if you are using the Sakai gradebook, you have to grade on a point scale because everything in the gradebook has to be a numerical value. And so let's just say this is worth 100 points. And so by default, it does not send the assignment to the gradebook, but you do have these options here. So you can very easily just say, send this assignment to the gradebook and it will appear there. Or if you have already set up your gradebook, manually created items through the gradebook, you will see this third option to associate it with an existing gradebook item. So let's say, and I've done that already. So here, let's say I want to associate this assignment to paper one, which I've created in the gradebook. So this third option is only going to appear if you have created an item in the gradebook. And if you haven't, that's perfectly fine. Just say add assignment to the gradebook and then it will appear there. The difference between these two is that when you use this option to add assignment to the gradebook, you have to grade in the assignments tool. If you try to grade in the gradebook, it's going to give you a padlock and not allow you to enter scores. You just have to grade in the assignments tool. Whereas this third option, it will allow you to grade in the assignments tool and in the gradebook. So it's just a little more flexibility, but either option is fine. And then here you have some additional options in terms of what types of assignments you can set up. So if you are breaking up your students into groups, you can do a group submission assignment. And so what that just means is that any student in a particular group can submit this assignment on behalf of their group members. And then as you're grading their submission, you would assign the same grade to all the students in that particular group. You can override individual students' grades. So if one student did particularly well, you can give them additional points. And then this peer assessment option, this is to allow the students to do peer reviews on each other. And so what you would do here, let me just select this option, the students all have to submit their assignment by the due date. Once that time passes, that's when Sakai is going to randomly assign who will review whose paper. So let's say you want each student to do three of their classmates, review three of their classmates' papers. That's what you would enter here. It can be anonymous and you can see um, here the students are able to see reviews on their submissions or you can uncheck that if you don't want to allow that. And so as the students are reviewing their classmates papers, they can provide feedback comments and a score. And so if they enter scores, Sakai is going to average out what each, uh, each student's classmates review on their submissions and you can override reviews or just completely override each student's final score if you want. And then the last thing would be to click on the post button and that creates it. So if all you're doing is just creating one simple assignment where you're collecting each student's papers, all you would have to do is enter the title, the instructions, the due date, if you want to send it to the gradebook, right here and then click on post and then that creates it. And so once the assignment has been created, you can click on the grade link under that assignment or in the in slash new column here, you can click on that number. And here it's going to show you all of your students along with their, the timestamp of their submission. And so you can click on a student's name to see 
their submission. So if they typed in their response, you would see that here, or you can download any attachments they've uploaded. And then here it's reminding you how many points this assignment is out of. So let's say the student did pretty well and give them a 93. And then you can enter comments here. Great job. Or let's say you wanted to add feedback directly onto their Word document with the review option that's in Microsoft Word. You can upload that attachment on here and return that to the student. And so what I recommend doing is saving and not releasing to the students until all have been graded. And then you can release all that feedback at the same time. And so if you return to list, this will take you back to the page where it shows all of your students. And then what you can do is click this release grades link here. And that will automatically send it to all students who have feedback. And then here in the release column, it will show you whose scores have been released and then it will send it to the gradebook as well. I believe there's a question about the Dropbox tool in the chat. And so that's another way that you can collect student papers if you don't want to use the assignments tool. And basically all that's going to do is create a private folder between you and each student. So when you go to the Dropbox tool, you would see a folder for every single student, whereas when the students go to the Dropbox, they would just see the folder for themselves and they have access to upload files in that folder to share with you directly. It's not linked to the gradebook or anything, so you can't provide a score or anything that way. It's just an easy way for you to collect anything the students might need to share with you. So that could be a good option if students miss the deadline for an assignment, for example, and they need to share their paper with you, that's a one way that you can collect it. Any questions on assignments? There's a question about any limitations to the file types that students can submit. I don't believe there is. And my colleagues, you're welcome to correct me if I'm wrong, but I think students can submit any type of file type. Okay, so then let's move on to the test and quizzes tool. And this is how you administer online assessments for your students. And so let me first orient you all to the test and quizzes tool. And so here at the top in the section, this is where you would create your test questions. And so once your test has been created, it will put it here in the working copies tab. Once that test is ready, you will publish that to students and it will make a copy of it in the publish, publish copies tab here. And this is where you will see the student submissions. So first let's walk through creating some test questions. And so there are two ways to do that. I recommend the markup text option when you're first creating your test questions because it's going to save you time by typing your test question. So let's take a look at that really quick. And you would enter the assessment title, just call this XYZ, click create for markup text. And so what you're going to see is this empty text box right here. And along with some links with different question types that you can create using the markup text option. And so what you have to do is type your test questions following a very specific format that Sakai recognizes. And so what you can do is click on general instructions to get some more information on what exactly Sakai needs. But what might be more helpful is just to click on the question type so that you can see the format. And so what I recommend that you do is to pull up this page so you can see the format Sakai needs and then type your questions in a separate document. You can type them in Microsoft Word, however Word likes to automatically format and it's a little tricky to try and edit that. So you could do this in Excel or in a notepad or a basic text editor basically. And what you will see here is each question is going to be formatted the same way and then how you have your answer choices, that's how Sakai knows what type of question this is that you're creating. So for example, we're looking at a multiple choice type of question. And so what you would see here is the question number in the parentheses here is the point value of this question. And then right below that is the question text. And then here you see ABCD with the asterisks 
this is how Sakai knows this is a multiple choice question. And we're going to look at these other options here in a little bit, so I'll talk about that. And so let's first look at some other question types. So fill in the blank. You have the question number, in parentheses, the point value of that question, right below that is the question text. And then here, this is how Sakai knows, this is a fill in the blank type of question. This is what students would have to enter in this space to get credit for this question. Or true, false, same thing. Question number, parentheses, is, uh, includes the point value of that question. The question text is right below that, and then you have true, false. And so that's how Sakai knows this is a true, false type of question. And so what you're going to do is in your separate document, type of your questions following that format. And so as you're um, typing those up, let me point out these two th or these three things here. This discount for a multiple choice question, what that means is that students would lose two and a half points if they get this question wrong instead of zero points. It's not required. I don't recommend using it. I don't think your students will like it, but it is an option if you want to use that option. And if you don't, just leave it off. And then also randomize. This is to randomize your answer choices and then the rationale. This is if you want students to provide a rationale for how they got to this answer. And so they just get an empty text box like this and then type in the rationale. So let's create some questions as an example. I'm going to copy this and remove the discount. And it's fine if your the order of your numbers is completely off. Sakai is going to fix that. And let's say I want this question as well. So you just copy and paste all of that. Let's say we want an essay question. And it's because the answer, there is no answer choice basically for the short essay. That's how Sakai knows this is an essay type of question. And then you would click on the next button. So type all of your test questions in the document first. Once you have those ready, copy and paste them into that box. And then here it's showing you all the different pieces of each question. As long as you follow that very specific format, that's how Sakai knows what each question type is. And so then you would click on create assessment. You can also create question pools, which is helpful, especially if you are concerned about potential cheating. You can create large banks of questions and put them in a question pool where you're telling Sakai randomly choose 10 questions out of this pool of 20 to give to students as they're taking this test. And so what that means is each time a student begins that test, they would get a different set of 10 questions of that question pool so that no student gets the identical test as they're taking these. And so those are some options that you have. And so here in this case, you would click on create assessment. And then below here, this is the test we just created. And so the other option is the assessment builder, which is fine if you want to use that. And so with that option, you would just create your questions directly in Sakai. And so let's say we wanted to um, edit an existing one. This is where you can see the assessment builder. So let's edit this existing test. And so with the assessment builder, you would use this option to insert a new question and then choose the question type you want to create. So let's say we wanted to create a multiple choice question. And so here you would have to enter the point value of the question, the question text, the answer choices, type them in these little boxes here and then select what the correct answer is. So I think it just takes longer to do it this way, but you can certainly create your test questions with the assessment builder if you prefer. The markup text option, which we looked at first, it is limited to a basic editor. So if you wanted to embed pictures, if you wanted to link out to a different website, bold, highlight certain texts, you can't do that when you're first creating the question. You have to do it after the test has been created and then edit that question. Because within the assessment builder is where you can enable the rich text editor. So this is the same editor you see in most other Sakai tools. And so this is where you can add 
additional information. So let me just put in question text and then say we wanted to embed an image into this test. And the way you would do that is by clicking on this little mountain icon. That is how you embed an image into the text box. And what I recommend doing with images, um, especially if you're sharing a lot of images with your students, is to upload them into the resources ahead of time into a folder just for the images so it's easy for you to locate them. And then also, I imagine you don't want your students to see those images in the resources um, until they take the test and then see them on the test. So what you can do in the resources tool is create a separate folder just for your test images and then say don't allow students to see this to um, allow don't allow them to see it in the resources tool but give them access to that so that when it does appear in their test they have access to that and so let me just walk you through that really quickly so let's say in the resources we want to create a folder just for your test images. So we go to actions, create folders, test images. I've probably already created one, so let's call this test images two. Create that folder now and then let me locate that. So then for this folder, I would click on the actions menu and edit the details. And what I can say is hide this folder, but allow access to its contents so that anything that gets uploaded in here, it won't be visible to students in the resources, but it will appear for them when they take their test. So then update that. And then you'll notice it's now grayed out and that lets me know students can't see this when they go to the resources tool. So then we go back to that test question. And let's say we want to embed it right in here. Again, click on the little mountain icon, click on browse server, and you all probably won't see the window that pops up, but I'm going to pick an image really quickly to embed in that question. And you always want to add alt text to any images that you're adding to Sakai, and that's for accessibility reasons. I'm going to leave that off intentionally to show you this next item. So I'm going to click on OK, and so now that embeds a photo of our very cute Sakaiger, which is the mascot for Sakai, being very responsible in the face mask. And so what I want to show you all is a very basic um, accessibility checker. And so it will check things like headers, if you're missing alt text. And so that is this little icon with the person in the circle. If I click on that, it's going to notify me there is missing alt text and I can just very easily type in Sakaiger in a face mask click on quick fix and then that will add it in for me. And then I don't think I've actually created anything in this question so I'm just going to click on cancel. But just keep in mind if you are using the markup text editor, it's a basic text. Um, so if you want to do additional formatting, you have to do that after the test has been created and then edit those questions. All right, I believe we're still good to go with test questions. And so earlier I mentioned you can create question pools and then have Sakai randomly pull uh, a number of questions from a pool. And so what you would do is you would create a new part on this existing uh, assessment. Let's call this part two. And then what you can say is this is going to be a random draw from an existing pool. So I've already created a question pool. And so this one right here has 16 questions. I'm going to say randomly choose um, eight questions from this. And then all of those questions will be worth two points each, for example. And so when students go in there, they will see a different set of questions. All right. And so now we're going to take a look at the different settings that you would add to an assessment. So adding the due date, if you want to make it a time test, thing like, things like that. And so let's say all of your test questions are done. So now we're going to click on select action for that test click on settings. And then the about this assessment, this is where you can rename your test title. You can require the honor pledge so students have to check that off before they begin the assessment. If you want to add an attachment, 
and then the availability and submissions tab. This is where you would add how many submission attempts each student is allowed, their, the due date, things like that. So let's say I wanted to give students two attempts to complete this test, I would change that here. And then the availability and due date, that is basically the window students have to take this test. If you want to make this a timed assessment, let's say we want to give students two hours and just with everything going on right now, if any of your students are at home, if you are making this a timed test, consider giving them more time than you normally would because at some point or another, your students will probably have connection problems. Um, so just keep that in mind. You can also give exceptions to the time limit and the due date. So if you have any students who have been approved for accessibility reasons, so if they've been approved by ARS to get additional time, or if you have a student who has a situation at home and they just need to take this at another time, you can do that. And I will show you all how to do that here in a second. But right now what we're doing is setting the time settings for the whole class for this test. And so let's say we wanted to give students an entire week to take this test. And let me switch that to, let's say, hopefully not on the first day of class, but let's say we make this test available on August 10th at, let's just say at midnight or 12 a.m. And then they will have until the end of the week let's just say till Friday to take this. So 11.55 p.m. Eastern time. And so what this means here is that students can start this exam at any point during that five-day window, but as soon as they start, they will see a timer of two hours and it will continue to run down as soon as they begin this test. So even if students pause or save their test and then exit, get out of Sakai, that clock will continue to run. So there's not a way for them to put a pause button on their test. As soon as they begin, they get two hours and that's it. So if you accept late submissions, you would put that here. For now, I'm just going to remove that option. And I do recommend checking the auto submit box here. And so that's just if a student accidentally forgets to actually submit their test, it will automatically submit it for them whenever the due date passes or after the timer runs out and it will be available by the next day. And then the third tab here, this is where you would add the exceptions for anyone who needs an accommodation. So all you have to do is select the individual student and then whatever their accommodation is. So if you want to give them three hours instead, this is where you would set that, click on add an exception, and then here they will appear. And you can still make changes to that or let's say you have a large class and you have a group of students who have the same accommodation, you can create a group for that uh, group of students uh, in the site info tool that we looked at earlier and then choose that existing group. So let's say all of my chickens get four hours instead of the two hours, add that exception and then they will appear here. So if you do have a group of students who need accommodations, and you want to create a group for them, make sure not to include their names or what type of accommodation it is in the title of the group because it will appear in other tools. So like earlier, we were looking at the messages tool. You can select groups to send a message to. That is visible to students. So you don't want to have any kind of identifying information in the title of the group. Okay, so then the next tab to look at is grading and feedback. So by default, Sakai does send tests and quizzes to the gradebook, but if you don't want to do that, just uncheck this box and then save those changes. And then here with the feedback, you can choose when to make feedback available and what exactly to include in that feedback. So what I recommend is selecting it to be available on a specific date and making that after the due date has passed. If you have any accommodations, just keep those other dates in mind as well. And then you can choose when it's available. So let's say, um, I think it was due on the 15th. So let's say on the 15th, that's when feedback will be available. And then here is what you would choose to include in the feedback when, once students have submitted their tests and it's available. If I pull up a blog post that we have real quick, this will give you an idea of 
what students see in their feedback. So depending on what you choose to make available, I'm gonna make this a little larger. So depending on what you check off in the feedback, and I can include this in the summary that I will send to you all after the workshop, um, this is what is displayed to the student, depending on what you check off in the feedback. All right. And then the last one is for the layout and appearance. So this is just where you can make changes to how your test is laid out. So if you want, um, by default, whenever you create a test, there will be a part one. And so all of your test questions will appear on one page. But if you want each question to be on its own page, or if you want to just put the entire assessment on one page, you can make some of those changes here. If your students are taking these at home, um, just keep their potential connection issues in mind, especially if it's a time test. If they are waiting for a, one question to load on every single page on a time test and they have a slow connection at home, for whatever reason, it can get pretty stressful. So just keep that in mind as you're adding these different settings on your test. And then also, Doug, earlier at the beginning of the session mentioned the Keep Teaching website. I recommend checking that website as well for resources and different strategies to use as you're um, doing online tests. Um, so uh, I recommend checking those out just for ideas from some of your colleagues on campus and other things to think about as you're creating online tests. All right, so then the next thing you would just click on save. If you're ready to publish, you can go ahead and publish it now. Or let's say we are starting from the beginning of this tool. You would locate your test, click on select action, publish, and then click on publish here. So once that is published, depending on what the availability date is, that's when students will see it. So even if the test is not supposed to be available until next week or whenever, Go ahead and publish it once it's ready and it will appear here, but students won't see it until that open date. Okay, so here in the published copies tab. This is where you will see the student submissions for your test. So let's see here. So here in the submitted column. This is when Once the first student submits to the test, you will be able to click on the number here to see all the student submissions. And so it's going to show you a list of all of your students. And so anything that Sakai can automatically grade, it will. So like multiple choice, fill in the blank, true, false, those types of questions, it will automatically grade that for the students. And then everything else, they will just get zero points. So you just have to make sure to go back and grade those questions. And so what you can do is you can click on the student's name to see their entire submission. If you are using questions where you have to manually grade those, so like essay types of questions, I recommend using the questions tab here at the top, which will show you all student responses for each question so that you can quickly grade the same question all at once. So let's see here on question four. Yep, this is an essay question. So here it would show you all of the student responses for this particular question and you can update their score based on the point value of this question, which is five points. So let's say the student didn't do so well, and we'll just give them one point. You can also add comments for the students. So that's part of their feedback. And then click on update, and then Sakai will adjust their final score on this assessment. So you can go back to the total scores page here, and then you can see the updates here. So that was a lot of information. Is there any, um, anything you all have questions about on tests and quizzes, maybe on assignments? Can I ask something? Sorry, mm -hmm. let me show my video. I'm very excited. I have a new background. Oh, that um, is exciting. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, where's my phone? There I am. So, um, is assign are assignments and exams different in terms of these submission issues or are they the same i guess i'm not sure i'm asking my question right um can you clarify what you mean with submission issues so i'm thinking about 
like when a student submits something by a certain date um, or has access to it for only a certain amount of time, should I be using tests instead of, does that make sense? Right, so you might have questions about um, whether you should use assignments or tests and quizzes because the tests and quizzes tool actually has a file upload type of questions. So if you wanted to collect attachments from students or like a Word document, you can actually just use the test and quizzes tool where you will have some additional settings such as setting um, a timer on their test or giving students exceptions to their due time or how many uh, um, or um, having more time to submit it. Um, so if that's the case, then I would recommend using tests and quizzes instead because the assignments tool won't give you an option to give students a different, uh, an exception basically, like the test and quizzes tool does. And so what you can do instead with tests and quizzes is let's say on this existing test, we want to add a file upload type of question. And this file upload question is only available in the assessment builder. It's not available in the markup text option we were looking at first. Um, but basically you just enter the question text and then when students take the test, they have an option to upload attachments to this and then just submit it. So if you wanted to add a time frame of having just an hour to complete this, even if it's just one question where you're collecting these attachments, you can still create that in the test and quizzes tool. Does that hopefully answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And again, this is sent to the gradebook. So assignments, tests, and quizzes both can be sent to the gradebook. All right. Okay, so let's move on to the lessons tool. And this is a tool I'm always excited to talk about. And so this is basically, it combines just about all of the tools we have talked about so far. So it brings all of your course content and activities, your syllabus, the schedule, everything into one place. So instead of having students go to the resources to download their files, to do the readings, or instead of them going to the assignments tool to submit their papers or take tests in the test and quizzes tool, you can pull all of that into the lesson. So um, basically think of it as it's bringing your syllabus to life and incorporating everything you're doing in your class into a lessons page. So to make more sense of this, I'm going to show some examples and look here. So if any of you all were in the workshop yesterday with the CFE, Emily Vaim had showed what, uh, her course site that she was teaching over the summer where she made use of the checklist feature in the lessons tool. And we're going to look at the more specific options that are available here in a little bit, but I first just wanted to show you all some examples. And so what she has here, um, she's broken it up into a getting started section and then broken it up into the different weeks of the summer course where students can see step by step what they need to complete for this particular portion of the lesson and then bringing in all that material directly into the lessons page. So this is coming from the resources. So instead of the students going to the resources tool, they can just stay within this lessons page to see all of the class materials right here or she's also using online discussion forms, the students can stay within the lessons tool to post their response to the discussion board. Or here submitting to this assignment, they do it directly in the lessons tool. So it really streamlines the learning experience for the students by keeping them in one place and where it's very easy for them to see step-by-step -step how you organize your content, but it allows them to see exactly what they need to complete and what's expected of them for each of their weekly lessons. Hopefully that makes sense. I'm going to show you all a couple of more examples. And so this site is a sample site developed by the cool folks at the Carolina Office for Online Learning. And that pun never gets old, but this is a sample site they have for um, some features that you can use in the lessons tool. And so what I like that they use is they often have a start here button where it kind of, um, gives the students an overview of what they can expect in this course, what's expected um, in this Sakai site, where they can go to get help and just sort of orient them to this course space. 
you can embed videos and other media onto a lessons page. So it will play directly on the lessons page here. I'm just going to pause that. And so it takes a lot of information that you might have in your syllabus and brings it all into the lessons page here. Bring up this example of the syllabus. And so again, you can embed images on there. Let's see, let me actually pull up another example. So this is another demo site that I have. And so here you can see I've broken it up into the different weeks. So if I click on that, the students can see whatever information I've added on here. You can break it up into the little different blocks and chunks of information. You can embed the announcements. I have another checklist here where the students can check off once they've completed something. I've linked to an assignment to a quiz so that students stay within the lessons tool to complete those items. You can also break it up. Let me pull up this example here. So very easily students can see for unit one that will be covered in these first three weeks. And then the last four weeks is when Unit two will be covered. So when students go to, this is called a sub page within this lessons tool, they can see everything that will be covered for this particular lesson. And so this is a file that's coming from the resources. Students just downloaded directly from this lessons page. This is a discussion form. So again, it just brings all of your course content, activities, any tasks students have to complete into one place. And so to get started, so actually before you start creating your lesson pages, I would recommend thinking about how you want to structure all of your lesson pages. So you can have it where you just have one big lesson page and then create um, the different sub pages within that lesson. And you can break that up by the week, you can break it up by the units, by the topic, just whatever grouping makes sense to you or like I have in this other example, you can have them appear here as their own top level lessons page. And if you wanted to keep creating sub pages within those, you can do that. So just think about how you want to organize your content first and then begin creating your, your lesson pages. And if you have any questions about how to maybe organize this or, um, how to use this tool. I mentioned at the beginning of the session, you can always submit a help request or sign up for a personal consultation with one of us in ITS Teaching and Learning. We can kind of walk you through how to use this tool um, as you're thinking about um, setting up your lesson pages. And, and also, as I mentioned at the beginning, if you want to hide any tools from students as you're testing it out, you can do that as well. So if you're testing things out, playing around with the tool and you don't want students to see any of that, you can hide it from them. So in the lessons tool, basically a good place to start is this add content menu. And this is where it will show you everything that you can add to a lessons page. So what I've done here is I've broken it up into the weekly sub pages. So if I go to week one, here you can see what I've added on here. And so if you click on add content, then you can add the next thing that you want to add to this lessons page and you can always reorder things as needed. And so what I have right here, this is a text item. And it's just that same text editor that we've seen in other places. So I can embed images in here if I wanted to. There's also a separate embed option within the lessons tool. If I want to link out to something, I can do that here. Or here I've embedded a YouTube video directly on this lessons page. This document here is coming from the resources. So if I want to embed a file on here, I would click on add content and then add content links. And I can upload it from my computer and then it will automatically put it in the resources. Or if I've already uploaded it into the resources, I can select an existing file from there. I can also choose to embed an entire folder from the resources tool. So if you've already broken up your resources into subfolders by the weeks, for example, you can select that as well. So the add content link that I just showed is for individual files, but if you wanted to do an entire folder, you can do that with this option here. And then it will add the item on here. Or this assignment, again, the add content menu, 
and then I can say link to an assignment or link to a test or quiz or the discussion forum. That's another tool. I can link to that that here. And so the students just stay within this lessons page to complete that particular task. And then a really great feature that I touched on briefly is the checklist and what we've heard from instructors is their students love this. So I highly recommend using this. So all the questions where you get, when is this due or how do I do this? You can just, where you would normally say it's in the syllabus. Here you can very easily break that down for the students so that they can see for this lesson, I need to watch this video, then complete the reading, submit this assignment, submit this quiz. And so another nice thing about the lessons tool is that you can require certain items be completed before the next item is available. So you see here next to these three items, I have the asterisks next to them. And that's because I've set these to be required. And then the assignment and the quiz are grayed out because I set those to not be available to students until prerequisites are completed. And so all that means is that anything that's required above those items have to be completed before the student can move on to the next piece. And so the way to do that, once I've added my items, is I click on the paper pencil icon next to them, and then I go in here and say, require this item. Click update, and then that will require it. And then for the next piece, I can require that as well. And then I have to check, don't release this until prerequisites are completed. And that's how Sakai knows that students basically don't give them access to this until this gets completed. Same thing for the quiz. It's required and it's not released until the items before that that are required are done. And then students have access to that. Another nice thing about requiring these items is that I can link a checklist item to something that's required on this page. And so you'll notice here this video I can check this off because it's not linked to anything. Whereas the reading, I have linked this due reading to this file. I've linked this assignment to that assignment here. So I can't check these off. They will automatically get checked off as the students complete those particular items. And I can also check their progress throughout the course by clicking on the still icon with three dots and three lines. And I can see how well or not well my students are doing. So this is a really great way to check in with students. If anyone isn't doing particularly well, you can see what their progress is on the lessons pages and then check in with them early to see what's going on and work with your students. So like I said, the students love this checklist feature. I think you would too. I hear it a lot from instructors. So I highly recommend using this if you do plan to test things out with a lessons tool. With anything that you want to add on there, just go to this add content menu and that's how you can add items to your lesson pages. Let's say as you're creating your weekly lessons, if you like the structure that you have, so let's say you have a header image, you have a little intro text box, videos and assignments that you want to embed and you want to reuse that sort of structure for the next weekly lesson, you can easily copy those items in and then just replace them with the um, discussion form, for example, for that particular lesson. And so let's say for, I think what week two is blank. Let's say I wanted to copy that same structure into my week two lesson. The way to do that is through this reorder button here at the top. This is also how you can reorder anything you have existing on your page. But in this case, we want to copy what we have from another lessons page, you would click on add items from another page here. And it's from week one. And then scroll all the way down. Use selected item. And then if I want to delete anything, I can do that here or do it later. Click on save. And so now it has pulled everything from week one and I can just make quick edits and say week two and then update whatever changes I need to make and save, and then replace the different items here as well. So that saves you some time. As I said, think about how you want to structure your lesson pages before you begin. Um, you can start working on kind of like a template for your first lesson and then 
copy that, reuse it for your other lesson pages. Any questions on this? If there's one tool I recommend trying out, it's the lessons tool for sure. Okay, so one last thing to take a look at before a few minutes for Q&A at the end is the gradebook tool, which we've talked about briefly here and there. So you can link the gradebook to different items in your Sakai site. So if you're using assignments, tests and quizzes, discussion forums, you can also um, send completed lesson pages to the gradebook as well. So if you want students to complete certain items and then get credit once they have completed that lesson, you can do that. And so typically what we see in the gradebook is instructors using categories to group a group of uh, items together. So what I've done here, let me actually bring up my settings. And so I'm making use of categories, which you don't have to use. You can really just set up your gradebook to have, let's say you have four total items. You have a paper, you have a midterm, and a final exam, and then participation. And so what you could do is grade each of those 100 points. I highly doubt you would set up your gradebook that way. But if you were to use that example, it would just add all of those items together and then average out the student score on a 100% scale. Um, and that would figure out their final grade for the course. Or you can use the categories feature. And so what I've done here is I've created four different categories and I've set them all to be 25% of the final grade. If you do use categories, you do have additional options of dropping the lowest scores in that category, for example. You can also add extra credit items to your gradebook. Um, and obviously your, your breakdown of your grading will probably be different here, but this is where you would structure out everything within this category is worth a certain percentage of the final grade. And what Sakai is going to do is add all the items within a category, average that out, and then say that's 25% of the final grade. So once you have that set up, you would create the actual gradebook items where you enter their scores. And so you would do that by clicking on add gradebook item, enter the title, the point value, and then if you are using categories, this is where you have to assign the category, and then include that in course grade calculations, and then those would appear here. And so as you're entering scores, it's pretty much just like a spreadsheet. You would enter their score in here. So let's say the student got a 90 here, the student got an 85. And so you'll notice here how things are getting marked out. And that is because I've set this category to drop the lowest score. And so in order to do that, all of the items within the category have to be equal to each other, just so it's all fair for the students. And so you see here that 90 is the lowest score the student received in this category. Let's say they got a zero for the first paper. And so it's going to adjust that and then average out their score for this category. And then here you can see what their final grade is. And so that's just dependent on any items that currently have for a student, then it's not going to count that grade. I don't want to get too into the details of the gradebook um, because there are a number of different ways that you can set up your gradebook. If you have questions about it, I usually recommend that you submit a help request to us at help.unc.edu. We can take a look at your syllabus and recommend how, um, what we think you should use to set up your gradebook. You can also sign up for a personal consultation and we can work with you directly on setting up your gradebook. Just a number of ways that you can get help. I brought up the forums tool quite a bit today. I can show you all that really quick just in case you're interested. And so that's if you want to do uh, have asynchronous discussions with your students. And so you're just creating a discussion board with the forums tool. And basically what you have here, there are three different levels within the forums tool. And the topic, which you can see here, move, welcome, week one discussion, these are the discussion boards. And within those is where the students will post their discussions. And so you can really just have one forum level and then post all of the topics, your discussion boards within that. 
by clicking a new topic here, entering the title, the description, that's what the prompt, where you will put your prompt, any questions students have to answer, and then all you have to do is click on uh, save and that creates the topic. And then the students, they would click on the name of the topic, start a new conversation, and then post their response. They can also reply to their classmates. If you click on display message content here at the top, that will show you everything that's been posted within this topic and all of the replies and you can quickly see what students have posted. You can send this to the gradebook, but again, this is for any asynchronous discussions you want to have with your students. There's a question about poll everywhere. There was actually a workshop on that this morning, I believe, but you can go to poll.unc.edu and there are FAQs here. This is how you can register for or um, uh, request an instructor account. This is also where your students would go to do a, a registration for their student accounts, but you can find all the information on here. You can also submit a help request if you have questions. Um, sign up for a consultation with my colleague Marla Sullivan. She's been posting a lot in the chat, but she is our expert on Poll Everywhere, and I'm sure she'll be happy to help you. I would just like to say, if I might, that this sounds complicated, and I don't use all these features, but I've been using uh, Sakai for several years now, thanks to Tony, who's a wonderful person, and I'm telling you, there's nothing like it to keep track of your grades, to, to communicate to messages to your students, um, uh, to keep track of everything. It, it's um, the great book. It, it's wonderful. And even though we talk about a bunch of different tools today, you don't have to use all of these, any of these. It's just whatever you want to test out. You can try something new each semester and then try something different next semester. Um, it's really up to you. But anything that you don't need your students to access, I do recommend hiding them from the left menu just to keep it concise and simple for the students so they're not bombarded with too much information and can just go directly to what they need to access. So I will go ahead and end it here. If you have any questions, feel free to check out the tutorials. This is on the Sky homepage. You can sign up for a personal consultation and you can always submit a help request at help.unc.edu and we can reach out to you and answer your questions. And just a special thank you to Towney for a wonderful leadership and uh, a great team behind you. Thanks to Marla and Andy who were in the chat as well. So I'll let you see if there are any other final questions, but thanks for all I the faculty. I appreciate all the applause. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Just know we're all here to help you. So if there's anything you're struggling with, trying to figure out how to set up in your Sakai site, just send us a help ticket and then we'll walk you through that. Good luck with your fall classes. Stay safe, be healthy, and be helpful with your students. I'm sure they're very stressed out as well. Thanks again for joining us today.